I'm so grateful that you've made the time to speak to us here in Australia. During what are some really strange times for everybody globally, how has Croatia and, and Zagreb in particular been reacting to the pandemic? Uh, uh, Croatia is probably the same as everywhere else. I mean, uh, to be honest, uh, the uh, experts here have done a really good job. We have a very, very low uh, COVID uh, rate here, low of people who have the, the uh, who have caught the virus, and, and also uh, people who have died. Um, but uh, we've had another addition to to the COVID was a, was a quite a big earthquake here a few uh, well a month ago now, and uh, everybody's trying to recover from that as well, you know. And did it affect you at all, the earthquake? You didn't have any troubles with it? Where I am, no. I mean, my house is quite a new house and it's all made of, out of concrete. Um, but all the old, the old town is old, old uh, um, buildings from the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which were, which were all sort of, you know, made from brick. And uh, there was a lot of damage. They, they said that it, there was damage to around nearly 40,000 houses or something like that, or, you know, buildings. It's devastating stuff. I saw the pictures. It was really worrying for a lot of the, the people there in the community, specifically mm. those in Zagreb. Um, I, I want to move on and, and bring up the fact that you have, and, and we're so delighted that you've made the decision to come out and speak publicly for the first time in a, in a very, very long time. I think everybody in the Australian community here, in the football community especially, were just thrilled because we've needed somebody of your calibre to come out and speak so honestly about the state of the game. But for many years, Dukes, you have been a bit of a mystery and I'd love to know what sort of motivated you to want to come out and, and speak now. Well, these conversations have been had for many years, you know, between us uh, ex-players and, uh, you know, players who are people who are involved in the game. Um, you know, a lot of it, a lot of it, uh, you know, it's not directly, uh, it's not directed towards the FFA uh, because I, I, I think they've done a good job in setting up the A League. You know, I can't say that they haven't. I think that that, that you know, at that at that time, you know, the NSL was was coming to an end, and uh, they took over, and somebody needed to take over. And I know I know people who make decisions. It's difficult. You know, they they do it in their best interest. But I think over time, uh, over time, uh, these. Um, uh, things that they didn't address were sort of coming to fruition uh, in a way, you know, with, with uh, including with the old NSL clubs and especially the player development. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's, that, that's the, the area where, where uh, they lacked the most, you know, they, they didn't quite uh, have a plan for the youngsters, you know, and um, also, also when when it was announced that the AOS was closing down, that was a huge surprise uh, to me because the AOS produced so many great players. You know, uh, players who represent first of all pl players who represent Australia, players who represented other countries as well. Um, but it was a huge. I know for for myself in my career, it was a huge stepping stone for you know for my development. You said that it made you the player that you were. Um, and you've been a big advocate for potentially re-establishing something like the AIS football program. Um, you know, talk me through sort of what your experiences were like there and why things, um, you know, worked out so well for so many of the players that came through the program. Well, first of all, you know, we went there as young kids. Uh, we were, I just turned 16. And, um, you know, first of all, uh, the preparation of being away from your family, which was a very difficult thing. You know, the first week or two, we, I was struggling, you know, just being separated from my family for that long. Um, so that got, got, uh, uh, got us used to uh, what was going to happen in the future in terms of, you know, going overseas and being independent as a person, person as well. The facilities were second to none. I mean, I've been to, you know, I, I, I spent a lot of time in Europe and I've seen a lot of facilities around the rest of the world. Even today, those AOS facilities would, uh, could match any facilities all around the world in terms of, uh, you know, uh, sports science, in terms of pitches. In th I remember going to the first time I ever saw the AOS pitch, you know, I, I think I was laying, I laid down on it for about, 10 minutes, I couldn't believe it. I was, I was in heaven. I never ever saw a pitch like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, but, and I think the most important thing there was, I think the biggest influence for, for, for me and a lot of the other boys was uh, Ron Smith. Mm. I mean, I'm a parent uh, these days and uh, I, um, you know, I can't imagine sending my, my boy, my boy's 17 now, my oldest son. I can't imagine sending him somewhere and somebody else actually, you know, being responsible for him. But to be honest, the first thing, Ron Smith, uh, he was like a second father to, to me and to us all. You know, that's, that's why a lot of, uh, we have such close relationships with him. You know, all the boys that had, had gone through that system, they really think so highly of him. First, firstly, as a person, and secondly, as a person who knows who knows his football, you know. And as I said in, a, in a, an interview before that, I didn't I didn't know football. Well, we were raised in our clubs. I started, as I said, uh, in Melbourne, Croatia, from 1982. And parents, you know, at one stage, my dad was our, our team coach for a couple of years, and then other parents' parents took over, and. As I said, they did they did the best that they could, but they never actually knew these details. You know, these tactical details, uh, uh, runs to make, where to, uh, how to run, how to run to make a run to score score goals, how to defend properly. These details were actually for the first time in my in my life were explained, and then you go and do these things consciously because before that. You were you were doing it as a player, uh, you know, unconsciously. You know, you're you're doing it just, you know, basically off the cuff. Mm. Uh, Smudger has been brought into that panel that to yourself and a host of other ex-players have been announced on earlier this week as part of the FFA's starting eleven advisory board. Um, can you talk me through sort of what you're expecting your involvement to be like? How the FFA approached you about it? How they sold it to you? And what you're expecting from it? Well, for now, uh, it's it's basically they they contacted me. They said that do you want to be uh, through Mark Bresciano, and uh, they uh, basically said it's like an advisory committee, which uh, you know, you know, basically it's a group of guys who are going to put their input in uh, to uh, to try to make the game better. Now, that's. From my understanding, uh, it's so far, you know. Uh, for me, uh, I don't know because I'm also living in Croatia how much, you know, I can be hands-on with it. But it, I think uh, the people that they've got on board are people who know football, first of all. They know the path to, to make it to the highest level. Uh, they've been involved in the, in the process of junior development as well. Uh, a lot of them, some of them have been like full team, uh, full uh, coaches in the A-League as well. So they've been there in the last 10 years. I haven't been there in the, in, in the last, I haven't been involved in the last 10 years like they have. But I think if we, uh, if we can get all these people together and come to a sort of general, general consensus on how the game can progress... I think it's a great thing. And, you know, when we're, we're all doing it, uh, you know, we're not getting paid for or anything like that, just to sort of have, a, have our input uh, and try to improve the game and uh, make it more exciting and, 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 and a better product for, for the future. It's something that we all want here in Australian football, but um, I think many of us can agree that it's, it's gone a bit wayward, uh, particularly over the last sort of five to ten years. Where do you think we've gone wrong, Mark? I think uh, I think it's not producing the players. I think that's the biggest problem. You know, the A League, as I said, when I was growing up, we had a uh, even when your brother was playing as well, we 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 competed with. Uh, you know, we were on par with the rest of the world up to under twenty three level. You know, and I remember watching your, you know, when Australia played Holland at the uh, for the Olympics qualifier when your brother scored that goal and that. And that we were, we had players up until that age group. Now our problem was that in Europe, they had that the top top quality league to kick on from that level. We had the NSL, which we we it was sort of it was uh, it wasn't the same level as the one in Europe, you know. So in terms of marketing, in terms of facilities, in terms of all that sort of stuff. So that's I think that's where we sort of stagnated when it got to playing uh, the, in, at, at the NSL level, you know? Whereas today we have, we have a, 
uh, we have all the marketing and all the television rights and all that sort of stuff in the league, but not necessarily we have those same amount of top quality players coming through to actually play in the league. You know, if I remember even in the NSL, uh, most teams, you know, you looked at, you know, Sydney United, uh, Marconi, uh, Melbourne Knights, South Melbourne Hellas, Adelaide City, they all had good youngsters coming through and they had good systems putting the youngsters through, you know. Um, and I think that that is the biggest problem, you know, that they, they addressed the, the, the highest level, but they didn't address, you know, who, who's going to play in it in the future, you know. Yeah, youth development has been a big topic of conversation at the moment. Um, and that sort of stems back to the nostalgia that a lot of people have for the NSL. It goes back to what you're saying in terms of the players that we produced. I was watching actually a grand final, the 97 grand final between the Brisbane Strikers. Uh, and uh, and it was fascinating to me to see uh, the squad that Sydney United had as well. Um, you know, five internationals playing in there up against some quality individuals. I mean, I feel like the talent that we produced then as well, Mark, was just totally different to what we're producing now. But I guess what we're trying to get to the crux of is why there's this big gaping hole now and why we're not able to, to produce players like yourself and of that era um, in, in today's standards. What do you think? Well, I think that's, the, that. as I said before, the, the problem is that, that it hasn't, hadn't been addressed. You know, everything was concentrated on the first league and a lot of these old NS club, NSL clubs, which were... Uh, which were producing these players were just uh, you know, left to fend for themselves, you know, in, in a certain way. Um, I don't think, uh, I think in a way, as I said before, uh, they, they turned their back on the old NSL clubs, you know, and I remember when I was back, you know, somebody said to me, uh, you know, something about, the, the, we were talking, it was a conversation about football and they said to me, oh, Football's only been here for 10 years. I said, are you serious? <laughs> you know, I said, where did, where did I come from? Where did, uh, you know, Paul Ocon come from? Where, you know what I mean? A lot of people think that just since the A-League has started, football, football has started. And uh, I, I, you know, I can't see, it, I can't see it, another way of uh, developing players unless you bring in these old clubs and set, put some sort of a standard into them uh, in terms of developing some sort of a structure in terms of developing these uh, players. But there's going to be, there's still going to be a, that gap between the senior A League and just see that, just say these NPL clubs. That altogether, the standard has to has to be lifted somehow, you know. And, and that's that's uh, one thing that we're, you know, we're going to have to address even in this uh, this. Uh, advisory panel that we have you know the standard has to be lifted up you know if you look at these clubs the nsl clubs they were at the highest standard 15 years ago or 20 years ago now they're you know i'm not sure what what standard it is now you know obviously it's not the same as before but uh somehow we're gonna have to we're gonna have to probably get them involved or, or work out a way, a pathway, an environment, which is the most important, the, the environment for youngsters to, to be the best. Mm. You made your debut for Melbourne Knights at 17. You won the Golden Boot for the two seasons that you were there, the Johnny Warren medal also, uh, and you helped them win the title in 95, the club's maiden title. How do you remember your time at the club? Oh, my time at the club. I mean, I grew up at Melbourne Knights as a kid. Um, my dad was constantly there. I mean, we, that was a religion for us. You know, we used to uh, we used to go to church on Sundays, and then after that, would, everybody would just go to the game. You know, later on when I was a bit older, I, I think I skipped out the church bit, but I just <laughs> kept going to the game. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, I I mean I loved it. My my goal my goal at that time in life was was to play for Melbourne Croatia. You know, I watched them since I was a little boy and I knew every player's names. I knew, uh, uh, you know, when they lost, I was, you know, devastated. When they won, I was euphoric, just just how it is normally, you know, like normal fans are. Um, and, uh, you know, with our history, we had, we had a really long history and we had a lot of good teams. You know, we were, we were, we were the minor premiers. Mm -hmm. 
many times before that, but we never actually, we always fell short when it came to the grand final. And uh, my, uh, you know, I was, you know, first of all, that team that we had when I was there from the 93 to 95, great bunch of lads. Um, they, uh, we, all, we all worked hard together and then afterwards we'd go out together and have a great time. Wherever we went all around Australia, you know, we'd always uh, have a good night out. We had uh, a really special uh, atmosphere over there. And for me, the, the icing on the cake was winning the title in 1995. That was, you know, for me being a, a follower of the club since you know, birth, um, it, it meant everything to me. Against Adelaide City? Do I remember the game? Yeah, against Adelaide City and the win in the grand oh, final. Of course, how can I forget? That was, uh, that was something special because I was in the grand final against them the year before that and Damien Mori scored a ripper to, uh, to, you know, for them to win the game. Um, as I said, we, came, we fell short uh, uh, many times before that and it was just a huge relief to, just to... Uh, to win it for the first time and uh, I just felt so proud and my parents were so proud. I just remember seeing my dad after the game and his, the smile on his face was, you know, that was priceless. The special memories. Um, from there you ended up kicking on to Dinamo Zagreb. Uh, reports said that Franjo Tujman was courting you endlessly, came to meet with your family, was basically desperate to get you to the club and you had a really successful spell there. But things started to go sour towards the end and it was so bizarre to read the stories about the fans starting to boo you. Dukes, what yeah. went wrong there in your time at the club towards the end? Uh, well... <laughs> You've got to understand Croatia to be understand to un to understand the the whole story. I think it's difficult for people in Australia to uh, to fathom the things that go on here. You know, in terms of uh, you know the, uh, the the mentality. You know, and uh, at the time when I came, uh, the Croatia was still in war. I mean, I came in '95 just before the big, the big operation of Uya Storm, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, people were all euphoric after winning, you know, after gaining, regaining their territory back and stuff like that. And, uh, and it was great for a few years. And then uh, towards the end, uh, Franjo Tujman was under a lot of pressure from, from uh, you know, the media and uh, things, things like that. And then because I was seen as somebody who, who he had brought to Croatia and somebody from, uh, you know, Australia, which, uh, uh, you know, I was a very easy target. And so basically they, 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 uh, they uh, kept, kept, you know, every day writing negative things about me and making up things and, you know, that I was on drugs, that I was doing this and that. And in the end, uh, to be honest, it got it got to the point where I would score I, I'd score a goal against Hayduk Split, which is a big derby, and my the whole crowd would be would be would be uh, instead of cheering for the goal, they would be uh, chanting against me. You know, so I realised that uh, it wasn't football. You know, it was uh, it, it got to the point where it was politics and not football, and uh, that's where that's when I decided that it was time to leave. At that point, then the deal was struck between Dinamo Zagreb and Celtic, and there was a lot of argy bargy, a lot of political stuff about, you know, the fee not coming through and all this stuff. But I think the big story was you deciding to come back to Melbourne to try and get your head right. Um, what was going through your mind at that time? Well, at that time, as I said, uh, there was there wasn't much internet and all that sort of stuff around. There was information was just through the through the newspapers or, or whatever. And uh, to be honest, uh, a lot of the things that were written here, you know, I didn't didn't really communicate to my family back home because I didn't want them to worry about me. I was by myself, you know, for for you know uh, for that period. It was a very difficult period. You know, there was a lot of pressure pressure put on me. Uh, and um, and basically, I you know I came to I, I came to uh, uh, Glasgow and uh, signed for for Celtic, and I realised that you know I I I I needed a rest from it all. You know, I needed to get my head together. I needed to uh, see my family again, and uh, and to try to sort of uh, regather. 
you know, re recoup and, and start on. To, because I went halfway through the season, you know, the Celtic was, uh, it was the, the halfway break and Celtic was, that was narrow during this season. And it was very difficult just to go from one situation and start into a new situation, um, uh, you know, out of nothing, you know, all of a sudden this is your reality. And then then next minute you're in a different, totally different reality, you know, and uh, uh, that was basically it, you know, and I needed to come back home and, and to uh, recoup basically. And you had a really successful spell there. I have to ask you though, what happened in that Scottish Cup game against Inverness? The halftime bust up apparently in the dressing room. What really went on there? What happened? Uh, that's a bit, that's a big one actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, what actually happened was uh, um, the as I was walking in. It's a difficult one to explain because there's a lot, lot before that. We, we were, we were struggling in terms of uh, on the, on, on the, on the pitch, whatever. At the time, I was the top scorer of the club, and um, we went into that game, and uh, uh, I think, uh, I think we copped two goals maybe in the first half. I don't, I don't remember it. I tried to, tried to rub it out of my memory bank that, uh, that game. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so basically, it was very frustrating. Before that, we were before even games before that, we were conceding a lot of goals left, right, and center. And for a for a club like Celtic, we couldn't. We we we, we you know we that shouldn't have been happening. And to be honest, I was I was a little bit a little bit upset about that. I mean, you know that that we we, we kept conceding goals. You know, we play against Cali Thistle, we, we, uh, which was a second division club, and we'd already conceded two goals. And then we had to, to, to be able to win the game, we had to sort score free. I walked in at half time. What happened was, I walked in at half time, and the assistant coach said to me, uh, he sort of questioned me and my, my uh, uh, what is it called? Uh, like, He's basically said to me, "What's the matter, big fellow? You don't uh, you, uh, you don't fancy it today." Mm. And then I and I and I just something in my head just clicked, and I and because uh, you know that's the type of guy, and I and I just you know lost it. I just lost it at half time, and I said, uh, "If uh, if I'm not good enough to play, if you think I'm not good enough, and I'm jacking it off, put somebody else on." Mm -hmm. And that's basically it. That's basically what I said to him. And there was a big fight and there was a big argument in the, in the monks of it. And there was other players that got involved in it and stuff like that. But that was that. I said, uh, he questioned my, uh, he questioned my... Um, commitment? Uh, commitment, exactly. And at the time I felt, uh, you know, I, I, was doing, I was doing my best. I was trying, you know, and games before that I was scoring goals when we would be losing games and all that sort of stuff. And in this one game, he comes in and, and he questioned my commitment to the team. And I said to him, look, and as I said, people think I busted up with John Barnes. I have nothing but, but you know, good things to say about John Barnes. I loved tr his training sessions. You know, he was a good bloke um, and everything like that. Um, but uh, w w what it was is... Uh, you know, I've got a bit of pride about me as well. So when somebody questions my commitment in in that type of a way, I, uh, you know, like like I don't want to play or something like that. That's uh, so. So I said to him, I said to John Barnes, I said, look, if I'm not good enough to play, put somebody else on to play, and that was that. Did you take your boots off and throw them across the dressing room? That was what was reported in the paper. I don't even remember. I don't even remember. To be honest. <laughs> I don't remember. I, lo I lost it. That's all I know. I just lost it. Everyone, from there on, you went on to Leeds, and everyone loves to recall that game against Liverpool where you banged in four goals. And I mean, it was something that was truly special for an Australian player to do that in the fashion that you did. Uh, it's just remarkable historically for us to be able to draw on that. But there was one thing that you said in that interview that really stuck with me. Um, when you were posed the question of if you could be transported back to any time 
in your career, what would it be? And your answer was in the backyard with my old man kicking the ball around. I thought there was something so nice about that because for me growing up, I mean, I never grew up being a player. I was surrounded by it at home, watching both my brothers, you know, standing in goals, getting the absolute shit built it out of me, uh, you know, because I was always the goalkeeper, right? In front of homemade goals. I mean, those, those memories, Dukes, I love more than anything. For me, if I could go back to any time in my life, it would be them because they were so innocent. It was just about football and family and fun. Um, was that why you wanted to go back to that particular time? And if there were or other times in your career that you could go back to what would they be where were you at your happiest well that time that I spent with my like for example my dad he was a he loved football you know he was a big football fan and he loved Croatia uh, Melbourne Croatia and he also he, was a, he loved you know he was one of those guys who wanted uh, a free Croatia in those days and that whole thing was uh, our community was all based around, uh, I would say, you know, fighting the cause for a free Croatia, you know, free from communism and all that sort of stuff. Now, uh, my father was the type of guy uh, who uh, every single day after, after he would uh, finish work, you know, he worked at the meatworks when he was, when he was uh, younger, I'd be sitting there waiting for him to come and play with me. And... Oh, excuse me. Uh, I'd be I'd be sitting there, uh, waiting for him to uh, come and play uh, with me. And there was not one time that he ever said, "No, I'm tired. Or, I can't do it." Uh, you know. And we would for hours we'd be kicking kicking uh, the football in the backyard for hours. And I I used to get he used to be a builder and he he um he had that lime in his in his um you know, that lime uh, the powder, you know? And I would, I would take the lime out and then make some sort of a contraption and draw on the, on we, I had like a grass area, and I would draw a football pitch there with, the, with this lime and all that. And we'd, for hours, would be kicking, uh, um, uh, you know, playing. And most of the time, you know, I know he was, he was letting me win a lot of the time. Um, so those are, those are memories that, you know, once you get older, when you, once you start playing football, uh, it's your, you know, I, I love football. That was my passion, you know. My, my, my passion in life was to play football. And uh, once you get to a certain stage, it still is your passion, but you're getting paid a lot of money to do it. There's a lot of pressure on it. And it's not as, I would say, it's not as uh, uh, pure as you know, when you're a youngster, you know what I mean? And uh, that's why I would like to, you know, that was the, the memory that I wanted to, to be taken back to, you know. That, for me, that's uh, one of the best moments in my life. Now, as I said, people don't know me as a, uh, as a, a kid growing up, or, or the people who do, they, they do, but most people know me as a football player who played for Leeds and Premiership in Australia and all that sort of stuff. And they only see one aspect of it. And everybody assumes that that aspect is because, you know, you're at the highest stage, you're all this and that. And they, everyone is, assumes that that is the be all and end, end all, but uh, which it is as a professional and, and, and things like that. But for me, these private things are more important. Mm. Your patriotism. I want to draw on that a little bit. Um, I was reading a book called The Death and Life of Australian Soccer by journalist T. Joe Gorman. It's a really fantastic read. But in there, um, he'd spoken to Clint Bolton, who was obviously at the Institute. And Butzer was saying that you painted your bed sheets uh, to reflect the, the Croatian flag. And, you know, you were singing Becera Sienasha Festa all the time and, you know, trying to get the other players, your fellow players, to learn the words, etc., um, you know, it was almost then, I suppose, given how much of, you know, your affections for Croatia came across so readily that you chose to play for Australia instead of Croatia. Um, you'd said already in that interview that for you, it was more about the Australian football community here and that it felt more like your community here versus Croatia. But was it ever a serious consideration for you, Dukes, to actually play for Hrvatska? No, no. I, I, I'd played for I'd played for Australia before Croatia was recognised. I think it was mm -hmm. as a country. So I don't think they could have played then. I think they came out to Australia as a as a, uh, you know 
for the friendly matches. I think they had a few friendly matches in Australia. And I think they still weren't in FIFA at that time. I'm not sure. I don't quote me on that. But it wasn't, it wasn't about that. I'd already played for, as I said, I went to the AOS and our goal was to play for the under-21s uh, uh, to make it to the Youth World Cup. Now, uh, it wasn't an option for me to play for Croatia. And once I got here, for, for example, I saw that I was, I was different from, from the people here, from the players here. I'd, I'd grown up in a different environment and, I, and, I'd, and I'd, uh, you know, I had a different mentality, even though I was, I was you know, of Croatian heritage. I had a different mentality because I, was, I grew up in Australia. And... Uh, once I once I did see that, I was happy that uh, that uh, you know that I that I actually played for Australia. I took note of the fact that when you had that Optus chat with the lads, they were giving you a bit of stick. Ja was saying that you were Hus Hitting's pet. <laughs> it, it wasn't. <laughs> is it true, Dukes? Were you his pet? Oh, that's not for me. That's not for me to answer. I don't think that's uh, that's more more for them. <laughs> look, I think I think yeah. Look, Gus, I, I liked Gus as a coach. I I think he liked me as a player, obviously. And uh, uh, he is one of the coaches where in my, that I, I, I'd say he is you know in the in the professional uh, environment that I've had. He was the best coach that I've had. You know, and, and yeah. if I was to go, uh, if I was to go back uh, in um, you know get back into football and, and to do uh, you know any sort of jobs like that I would you know there'd be a lot of things that he did with us that I would implement you I heard that you said you were doing your coaching badges is that something that you'd be thinking about down the line about getting into coaching well the, the question is I think with me and and with every with a lot of the players and whoever is that being a football manager means giving a hundred percent it's not a hundred percent two hundred percent you know being a player it's it's uh, two hundred percent but uh, being a, being a coach is even more you know and uh, the lifestyle of a coach is not you know people think that it's all glamorous and all that but the lifestyle of a professional coach is not glamorous at all you know you you're moving around you're chopping and changing your kids uh, have to move schools and uh, it's not an ideal lifestyle especially when your kids are younger you know and and I, I said I said to myself when I when I finished playing football first of all I wanted to get out of the limelight uh, and second because I'm quite a private person second of all uh, uh, I wanted to spend time with my kids, you know, I wanted to, to be there, you know, like my parents were for me growing up. I wanted to be there, you know, if they said, let's have a kick in the backyard or let's have this, you know, I wanted to spend that time with them, you know, instead of, you know, looking after 20 other people. And, you know, it's a big responsibility being, uh, being a manager not just a responsibility to the team, you've got a responsibility to fans and, you know, just the same as in football. So if you're going to do something like that, you have to be prepared to sacrifice everything. And at this point in time, I'm not ready to, to, to do that. Maybe one day when my kids are a little bit older and, you know, they, they don't really, you know, they start having their own lives and all that. Maybe, some, maybe I'll get back into it in, a, in some sort of capacity. But maybe I won't, you know. It, it's not. It depends on how you know. If I get that urge again to say, yeah, I wanna, I wanna, you know, I wanna, you know, a challenge. You know, I want a challenge to see whether I can do it or not. Yes, but uh, if I'm not ready to to actually sacrifice everything again, because you you gotta you gotta realize, as especially coming from Australia, I think that we as Aussies had probably the hardest path to get to the highest level than anybody else. You know, if you look at, uh, if you look at other countries, you know, you've got Brazilians who are, I remember when I, when in, in England, when I was, when, you know, you say, oh, I've got a Brazilian, straight away everybody's looking to buy it because they're Brazilian. You know? mm -hmm. They say, you know, now Croatians are the same. Croatian youngsters are in these days because of the, the way that the, the reputation they've had, you know, from through the World Cup and, whatever, but uh, Australia, you know, they look at you and they think, I remember when I came here, they, they thought, you know, what's this kangaroo going to do here, you know? 
And uh, that's the reputation that we had. Now, just to get anybody to see us in those days, I think the biggest, uh, the biggest, um, uh, what was it called, showcase for us was the Youth World Cup, and uh, the uh, and the Joeys. I think the is it the Under Seventeen World Cup, yeah. and the Olympics. That was the way that people from Europe and and the bigger leagues actually got a, got got to have a look at us, you know. And from there, you've got you, it's it's a hard path, you know, especially for us who. Uh, didn't have the European Union citizenship and all that. We had to play 75% of our national team games just to be able to get a work permit in these countries. You know, so it was a huge sacrifice. We left our family, we left our homes. You know, we, I hear stories about people in England who they come from London and they, they play a couple of years in the, Europe, in, in the North and then they start saying how, uh, how we, uh, you know, they want to move back down south because they, they miss their families, you know, and I'm thinking it's a three hour drive or whatever. So we from a young age had to leave all that behind and sacrifice everything. Now, some people reaped the rewards from that. Some people didn't, you know, and as I said, to become a manager, a proper, you know, uh, full time manager again, I have to be and whoever it is has to be prepared to sacrifice everything. Is a return to Australia off the cards for you entirely? I heard many years ago um, that you were offered a role with Melbourne Heart that you turned down. But is something here in Australia ever on your mind? No, you know what the thing is with Melbourne Heart? Melbourne Heart um, uh, wanted me to play when I came back. But see, again, another thing from that interview which was reported wrong was that um, I... Uh, Melbourne Heart offered me to, if I was to keep playing, but I, I didn't want to play. I, you know, I had an offer to, to go to Fulham for a couple of years. And I, and basically the reason why I stopped playing was because I knew I couldn't do it anymore. You know, I knew that I couldn't do what I wanted to do. You know, my mind knew, knew uh, you know, that's the catch-22. When you get older as a player, you've got the experience. You're not as nervous, you know, in, anymore. You you know, uh, you've got you've got that cleverness about your play you know you don't you, you don't waste energy where, where you should where you shouldn't and, and things like that but then your body starts to sort of give way after a while you know and my last couple of seasons at Newcastle you know I was injured for a long time and and that for me was the worst thing you know I hated you know people say that people keep saying and when I was younger I said I was a lazy lazy player but I, I was I was anybody who played with me and whatever can probably vouch, you know, I wasn't a lazy player. I, I loved playing. So it, basically, if we did sessions with the ball and all that sort of stuff, I loved doing that. What I didn't love was I didn't love when they said to you, go and do 50 laps or yeah. go and do, uh, you know, 20 sprints or and that. That stuff I didn't love. But give me the ball all day, I'll be, I'll be out there, you know. And that was, that was the difference. Um, and uh, now, now I've lost track. What was the question again? Uh, if a return to Australia is off the cards or it's something that could be, you know... A yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. What I was saying about with, with Hart, they offered me, uh, they offered me uh, uh, to play again, you know, there, and I didn't want to play. But what I was saying in that interview was that, you know, uh, I got a lot of uh, people calling me up and saying, you know, do you want to come to my dinner? So we come to the dinner so we can get more supporters or, you know, Things like that, but nobody ever asked me, Dukes. What do you reckon about our youngsters? How are we going to get our youngsters to get to uh, get to the to the highest level? Or they, or, or what do you think of the A League? Or what do you think of? They didn't ask for any input. That's what I was I was saying. You know, nobody, and and that was a conversation that was happening between a lot of ex soccerers You know, um, and that's why in that interview I I decided to say that. You know. Um, coming back to Australia, you know, as I said, I left Australia in 95, and that was a long time ago, mm. and I actually love the European lifestyle, you know, and I went back to Australia for uh, a couple of years on two separate occasions, and I found that, I, you know, after that many years being away, it was difficult for me to... Uh, um, to sort of uh, 
not reassimilate. It, it was fine like that. I, I think I'd just gotten used to too used to the uh, European lifestyle, mm -hmm. and uh, it suited me, you know. And especially in Croatia, Croatia's got you know probably the best lifestyle uh, you know, on earth. I would say. <laughs> I'm not going to argue with you on that one. Um, a few more questions before we wrap up. I know I want to let you go, but I've still got a lot to ask. Uh, but I, I want to ask you about the heartbreak uh, of failing to qualify in 97 against Iran in Melbourne at that night. Uh, how did that feel? But that was just, uh, you know, that was just a shock. That was just a huge shock. I mean, we, we, we uh, came back from uh, Iran and... Uh, in that game, we pumped them. You know, we we actually did really well. We created a lot of chances. You know, we we were winning. Was it two nil? Was it? Yeah. Was it two? Was it two? Was it two one at the end? Wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. And then that idiot came on and bloody uh, did that thing. Oh, and it sort of just paused the game for a little bit, and I don't know, caught us off our guard, or I don't, I don't even know what happened. But that was devastating. That was so devastating because that would have, you know, for even for the generation that went later on to, there was a lot of, uh, to uh, Germany, there was a lot of players who were in that uh, squad. And uh, uh, that would have been a huge thing for us to, such, at such a young age, experience that World Cup and then go also to the next one. You know, that would have been a huge thing for us. It would have been massive. But, but it wasn't, wasn't to be. It wasn't to be. But it was in 2006. Um, after 32 years, Australia finally qualified. Um, the ecstasy that everybody experienced when we finally did was just incredible. But what are your memories like? Um, you know, the game against Japan, obviously the loss against Brazil, but then the match, uh, you know, it was just phenomenal for us to be able to progress the way that we did and, and the heartbreak of then crashing out against Italy. But then for you emotionally in the group stages, playing against Croatia as well and getting the result. Um, you know, what are your memories like? Like, um, firstly, of the, the, the game against Japan? Uh, the first game against Japan, I th thought we did really well. You know, I thought it was a tough game. I thought, uh, just, I just thought that uh, we were unlucky. We had a few chances at first. And then, you know, we conceded a goal that, you know, was sort of... See, I'm, I don't remember. I haven't, I haven't you know... I, I, I don't remember. I just off the off the cuff. I haven't seen the whole game for for a long time, mm -hmm. but uh, I remember. You know, I thought it was against the run of play that we conceded a goal, the Japanese goal. Mm -hmm. And after that, after that, you know, it was difficult. It was difficult to break them through. You know, it was difficult to break through them. I thought. Uh, you know, we did our best, and in in the end, you know, with uh, Timmy and uh, and Johnny. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was such a relief, you know, the first... Uh, because, as I said, in that first game, I thought we deserved more early on, but that's how it is in football. Sometimes, you know, when you deserve... Uh, you, you know, you do really well, they go up the other end and they, they, they cop, you cop a goal from nothing. And that's what happened. And then it, it put us behind, you know. We were, we were chasing the game from then on. And, you know, thank God, towards the end, uh, we managed to score those, uh, those two goals. The game against Croatia, for you coming into that, how did you feel? What were the emotions like? For me, uh, against Croatia, because I knew most of the people there and uh, the, the coach of Croatia was actually my coach at Dinamo, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think I had, to, I had a point to prove after the way I left Croatia. You know, I think I had a point to prove against those people. A lot of those people there were... Um, um, you know, in the lead up to the game, especially with the press, you know, I had a lot of problems here with the Croatian press. And uh, the lead up to the game, um, you know, they were, they were sort of, uh, uh, what is the word, you know, trying to, trying to put, us, put us down in a way, you know, saying that we're not, uh, you know, that we're, we're kangaroos, that we don't know how to play football and all that sort of stuff. And uh, that it should be an easy win for them, you know, you know, a little bit of arrogance there. And uh, for me personally, um, you know, even though I have Croatian background, for me personally, I, I was desperate to win that game, for us to win that game. 
I was watching an interview with Joe Shimonich um, and he was asked the question of who were some of the most difficult players that he's had to mark in his career. And he said Zlatan Ibrahimovic and Mark Viduka. Wow. Uh, yeah, wow. Yeah. Wow, there you go. Um, Joe, top guy. Uh, it was really nice to sort of see his face pop up again and to talk so candidly about his career and his reflections. Uh, but for you, who were some of the toughest players that you came up against? Toughest players that I came against? Uh, there was... There's two... Tough as in tough strength-wise. Uh, not strength, like physically, I would say... I used to have a lot of bat battles with Martin Keon all the, all the time. We were sort of like cat and mouse, you know. Uh, every time he, we used to play for Leeds against uh, Arsenal, we'd always have a tough one, you know. He'd like to, he'd like to throw in a little sucker punch behind play and things like that, and try to try to um, annoy you as much as possible so you can get sent off. So that was very annoying, but. Uh, uh, I think one of the toughest defenders that I ever came against, and good defender, obviously Rio Ferdinand was a good, good, very good defender. I mean, I had a lot of time when he played with us at Leeds and I used to train against him a lot, you know, and you'd get past him and then all of a sudden he'd pull out this bloody huge foot and he'd, he'd, he'd somehow get it back off. Yeah, it was, he was a good, good defender, but one of the, the toughest was a guy called Ayala. He, I played against him he played for Argentina, but he was a little guy. He played for Argentina, Argentinian guy, and he also played for Valencia. And I played against him uh, for the two legs against uh, uh, Valencia in the semi-final of the Champions League. And uh, he would be one of the toughest, toughest players that I played against. Is there an achievement you're most proud of? Oh man. Uh, a personal achievement, you know, I was very, I'm proud of them all, you know, I can't say that I'm, I'm, I'm not. I mean, as I said, all those awards that I got when I was playing for Melbourne Knights, that was just, you know, that was like a dream for me. I would never have thought that those things would happen. But um, I would say the, one of the mo the achievements was when I was voted Scottish Footballer of the Year and when I was I ended up top scorer in, in Scotland. That's probably the achievement, uh, one of the most satisfying things uh, for me uh, in my career because uh, because I, I went down to a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, a big cloud of, uh, you know, controversy and all that sort of stuff because of when I went back to Australia and, and you know, it was basically, you know, I, 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 first of all, the Celtic fans supported me the whole way, you know, and I've heard a lot of people saying, you know, a lot of comments, negative comments and all that sort of stuff about my time over there. But I would li I'd like to say, you know, that I gave, you know, my all when I, at that club, you know, and in the end I was voted by the, the fellow players as the player of the year, you know, for the, for the whole league. And, uh, you know, I really had a point to prove when I, when I went there, you know, because because of all that thing at the start. And, you know, that was the most satisfying for me. Any regrets? Any clubs that you'd wished you'd played at? Leagues, potentially, that you could have played in? Um, deals that fell through that you wish now, in hindsight, actually Look, came through? You know what? Things, uh, the thing is with people, people uh, who aren't in the football game, uh, they don't realise that when, it, when a deal's made, uh, I think the least amount is the, the the least amount of influence is from the player. You know, it's basically the the two clubs have to come to an agreement. And uh, you know, obviously, if somebody's interested in the player, they approach you and they, you know, they they ask, would you want to do it? But then afterwards, it come, they have to come to come to agreement with a transfer fee, or uh, you know, and you have to come to an agreement with wages with them and then all that sort of stuff. So there's a lot of factors that happen, you know, and I, as I said, I had offers from, you know, in that time, there was offers from heaps of clubs. It wasn't just the two that were mentioned in that interview. But, um, you know what? 
things happen for a reason, I think, you know, and it, the, the thing is that uh, um, you, uh, Sometimes you know you 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 can't control them, and I, you know what? I'm I'm very very happy that I that I played for Leeds at that time. Very happy. All, all the clubs I played for, you know, Melbourne, Croatia, Melbourne Knights, uh, AIS, uh, Dinamo Zagreb, uh, Celtic, uh, Leeds United, Middlesbrough. And Newcastle, I am very proud that I represented all of those clubs. Very, very proud. That was my path, you know, and uh, you know, I'm no regrets whatsoever. Mm, it's nice to hear, Dukes, and it's nice to chat to you. Um, on behalf of everybody watching this, I'm sure we can all agree that it's so great to be able to hear from you after all these years. As we say in the mother country, Svakati Chast, I wish you all the very best. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you and your family are holding up really well back in Zagreb, um, you know, and it'd be great to have you back out to Australia. You're welcome here anytime. So thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Lucy. It was a pleasure.